Hello and welcome to Medical Dialogues. I am Dr. Nandita Mohan and today we welcome you all for a discussion on the recent paper published in European Heart Journal Acute Cardiovascular Care August 2025 issue. Now the title of this paper is Reperfusion Therapy for STEMI in Low to Middle Income Countries A Clinical Consensus Statement of the Association for Acute Cardiovascular Care The European Association of Percutaneous Cardiovascular Interventions The European Association of Preventive Cardiology The ESC Working Group on Thrombosis And the STENT Save a Life Initiative now, ST elevation myocardial infarction, as we all know it as STEMI care, remains suboptimal in many low and middle income countries, with registries from Latin America, Africa, and Asia showing that fewer than 65% of patients receive reperfusion therapy. Now, treatment delays, limited resources, and poor access to optimal care, all of these contribute to preventable deaths and complications. While existing guidelines outline best practices, implementing them in resource-limited settings remains challenging. Now, this consensus proposes a practical framework to strengthen STEMI systems of care. Now, congratulations to Dr. Thomas Alexander. Today, we will be discussing some of the questions related to this with him, who is a senior interventional cardiologist, head of division of cardiology, Kovai Medical Center and Hospital, Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. So, I welcome you to Medical Dialogue, sir. It's a privilege to be having you on board here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Nandita. So, sir, as we're discussing this paper today, so now, sir, the paper proposes a flexible three-model pathway, that is thrombolysis only, pharmacoinvasive, and primary PCI models. In your view, which model actually offers the best balance between feasibility and clinical impact for resource-limited regions? Okay, again, um, I think, let me show you, I mean, let me tell you how we move to this three-model framework. Now, the initial framework that we or the model that we had developed was what we call a pharmacoinvasive primary PCI combination in a hub and spoke model. So essentially there was a hub hospital which had a cath lab where if a patient presented directly he would get primary PCI but these were linked to multiple spokes which were located in the peripheral regions you know within two hour driving distance of the hub where we train these smaller hospitals to give thrombolysis and then within the next three or two to 24 hours move them to the hub for the invasive part of pharmacoinvasive. Now clearly this is the most ideal sort of a framework for a third world country. But when the government of, uh, of Chhattisgarh invited us to start a program there we quickly realized that these hub hospitals that we talk about that the uh, Many other southern states uh, have cath labs virtually in every town now. It was clearly not available in states that, um, you know, the northern states and, of course, in the northeastern part of our countries. And therefore, we really needed to look at a more practical way of running a program there. So there it was a question of moving from no reperfusion to some form of reperfusion. And that's where the first thrombolysis only model came about. And then we realized that there were urban places, you know, if you take major metros, there are multiple cath labs or hospitals with cath labs within very close driving distance of each other. So when you take a, 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 a geography like that, you could look at what is available, say, in the West, um, in Europe or in the US and look at a a primary PCI based model. So that's why we looked at the three models. I think we have to understand that India has, is a diverse country with very, very different infrastructure and medical manpower availabilities. And therefore, what we do when we suggest a particular model is to say that, okay, we will map your geography, both in terms of infrastructure in ter terms of uh, medical personnel availability and then suggest what is the best model that will work there. But remember that these are um, uh, modular. You can move from one model to the other as infrastructure improves, as uh, medical personnel as well as cath labs increase in numbers. You could move from one model to the other. So um, uh, if you start, say, in a very remote area with model three, I think as infrastructure improves, we could move from there to model two, 
and then hopefully at some point in time India, like the Western countries, would move into Model One. Understood. Understood. Now, sir, looking ahead, what would a successful STEMI network in India look like in the next three to five years? And according to you, what collaborative roles should interventional cardiologists and governments and industry all together play to make it happen? Well, I think uh, the early adopters are the southern states, and if you look at, say, Kerala, Tamil Nadu. Uh, Andhra Karnataka these are the states that have sort of got on to this bandwagon uh, Tamil Nadu was the first state where we ran the program and then now it's there across the state uh, Karnataka has started Andhra is on the way so what i see is that the hub and spoke or the pharmaco invasive will be uh, will be quickly ramped up in the southern states Uh, we are now seeing some moves, say in Punjab, in UP. Uh, there is a move to develop these programs. So uh, these are states where we're going to see a much slower, but I'm I'm sure we will see that happening there. But I think the worry for for all of us is that the states in the northeast and some of the 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 states in in the uh, in, in mid. Uh, you know, Madhya Pradesh, in the in Jammu and Kashmir. I think these are the states which are the slow adopters, and I, I, I think there has to be a greater push from the government, and of course from the medical bodies. The medical bodies are fully behind these programs. You know, the Cardiological Society or the Association of Physicians, because they're part of one of the uh, the documents, a uh, consensus statement from India. Which said that we need to move in that direction, but I think we need to push governments, get it into the manifestos of uh, political parties, and I think there has to be a lot of public uh, pressure on government to push these programs across the country. So, uh, your your question of three to five years, yes, we will see uh, many of the southern states definitely uh, progressing much quick, much uh, faster, but I hope at least model one. Will be implemented in uh, some of the remote parts of our country. What specific gaps or on-ground challenges in LMICs such as India prompted the development of this consensus statement? Okay, I think that's a great question because um, if you if you look at systems of care that are available in the developed countries, particularly if you take the US or you take Europe, now. There is a well-developed infrastructure around which the network is 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 developed. So you have good roads, good connectivity, you have good ambulance services, and paramedic trained trained to do ECGs, read ECGs, and then move the patient appropriately through these ambulance networks. So today, if you take the US, if you call nine one one, you can be virtually certain. That an ambulance will arrive within the next five to ten minutes in your a place to pick you up. Now these ECGs, which will be done by the paramedics, the paramedics themselves are well trained to read these and then move the patient to the closest reperfusion center, and that usually would take less than thirty to sixty minutes. Now, when Ajit and I started STEMI India, the thing that we were asking ourselves, what the question was. Do we wait for all this infrastructure to be available in this country before we set up, say, a STEMI network, or were there better ways of managing these patients in the situation that we are in? And this is where we decided that we would first try out uh, a different model that we knew would be more practical and. Able to implement it with all the infrastructure deficiencies as well as manpower deficiencies that exist in our country, and this is where the STEM India model, the hub and spoke model that we first put in put together, and the validation trial was run in Tamil Nadu. Actually, it was published in JAMA uh, Cardiology in 2017, and that's considered a landmark paper because it, for the first time. We were able to show that a model that really would work in a third world country could reduce mortality to almost the same as a fully developed model that exists in the developed countries. 
and this i think was the first step in moving towards a a new model that today is now being uh, circulated as a global model for low and middle income countries so now lastly if i may ask sir what message would you like to share with younger cardiologists who aspire to bridge the gap between evidence and access in cardiovascular care well well uh, uh, I, I must tell you that at every meeting that I speak, the the most enthusiastic group are the young cardiologists who are really trying to push the boundaries to see can we get the best of care to the population that we serve. So there's no doubt that the younger cardiologists want to do that, and to them, what I would say is that uh, wherever you work, whether it's in the government sector or in the private sector, see where you can get these STEMI programs going so that. more and more of our patients will get appropriate reperfusion therapy early so that um, the myocardial damage is prevented and um, and and you get the best results possible so thank you so much dr thomas for joining us today and giving us all your valuable insights on this consensus thank you so much for being a part of this discussion thank you for having me on this